Instant cold packs are a great way to feel thermodynamics in action, especially on a hot day such as today. But how do these work anyway? Brr. So don't worry about the terms yet, we'll get into them in a minute. Um, but here's the basic idea. Inside of the outer pouch, you have an inner pouch. And inside of the inner pouch, you have a salt. So often this is like ammonium nitrate. Now, outside of that little pouch is going to be water. So the little pouch is keeping it from them from interacting. But when you break that pouch, now the water is going to come into contact with that ammonium nitrate. When this happens, the ammonium nitrate is going to dissolve and dissociate. So when something dissolves, it gets a full water coat. When something dissociates, it actually breaks up into its component ions. So ammonium nitrate is a salt, so it's made up of a positive part and a negative part. Um, and so it has this positively charged ammonium ion, it's cation, and a negatively charged nitrate ion, um, this anion. Now, positive and negative charges like to be together. So it's going to take energy to bring them apart. And this is called the lattice energy. So the energy that we, it takes to break up this um, like plus minus network of solid ammonium nitrate and actually get it um, to break up. But that's not all you have to do in order to get it to dissolve. You also have to get it to be surrounded by the solvent molecule. So in this case, water. Now, when you're doing this, you will have to break up the water molecules. And the water molecules are having a nice network because water molecules, they have these partially positive and partial negative parts. Um, and so they don't have full negative and positive, but you can still get attractions with those partial positive and partial negative charges. So you're going to have to put in more energy to bring those water molecules apart. So it's going to take even more heat. But now you're going to get back some energy. And this energy is going to get given back when you are, um, when the water molecules and the ammonium nitrate molecules can now hang out. So the water had to give up its other water contacts and the ammonium had to give up its nitrate and the nitrate had to give up its water. But now you're going to make some bonds to the ions. So you're going to make some um, ion water bonds. Um, so now you're going to get some energy back because when you make these bonds, now you are um, releasing energy. So it takes energy to break bonds. And conversely, you get energy back when you make bonds. And so these can be like full bonds, or they can just be like attractions, things like hydrogen bonds and partial charge, partial charge um, attractions, various sorts of intermolecular interactions. So like things between the actual groups, those can count as well as the inter um, intramolecular um, interactions, so like between the atoms in the molecules. And so too much detail there. But basically, you have this energy that's then um, given back. If this energy that's given back is greater than the energy it took, then things are going to feel hot. But if the energy isn't as big as the energy that it took from the surroundings, then it's going to feel cold. And in this case, because we're just making these like ion um, water bonds, in this case, they're not, uh, we don't give energy much, as much energy back as we took um, from our surroundings. Um, and so what do I mean by like our surroundings? We have to consider what what our universe is. And so our universe in this case is going to be the system, so which our pouch with those reacting molecules and the surroundings, so the stuff that's around it. So everything like your hand or the air around this pack. And what's going to happen is that heat is going to get taken from the surroundings because it's got to come from somewhere, right? That's kind of like well, that's the first law of thermodynamics, that energy can't be created or destroyed. It can only change forms and move. So heat is a form of energy. Um, and so you can't be just like having heat come and go out of nowhere. Um, you have to have this balance and this balance plays out in this universe. So it's taking heat from this universe and therefore the universe is gonna get colder. Um, so if you touch it, you're gonna feel colder. Okay, so why is this reaction actually happening in the first place, though? Like, if it requires energy to happen, like, why is that happening? But it's heat is the only one component of what we call of this like Gibbs free energy. And I'll get more into this in a minute. 
But basically, we have that was considering the enthalpy term, the, the heat, uh, the energy of the bonding. But we also have to consider the entropy term. And so entropy is going to be like a measure of randomness or disorder. And the second law of thermodynamics tells us that, well, nature likes that. Um, and so increasing the entropy of the universe is favorable. So this can get kind of confusing sometimes because it's like often reactions happen, like favorable reactions make more stable products. Um, and this like more less like more ordered things, how is that happening? And it's because it's counterbalanced by this randomness that you're introducing in the environment. So for example, if molecules come together, maybe they give off um, Maybe they give off uh, phosphate, maybe they give off, um, they break up water molecules. This is a common thing with like binding energy. When something binds, um, now you're releasing all of that ordered inner, ordered stuff that was ordered water. And this provides um, like entropy to the environment, which just makes it happy. So whether a reaction is spontaneous or not, is this we can determine by this term called Gibbs free energy. I like to think of it kind of like couch shopping. Um, and basically, if you were going to shop for a couch, you would have to a couple of things to keep in mind. One would be like, well, how much room do you have to spread about? And this would be like your entropy. And another thing would be like, well, how cushy is it? Is it comfy? Do you have to squirm a lot? And this is kind of like the enthalpy. So it's like, do you like the reactions that you like the bonding partners that you're with? Are you happy? Is there um, and that sort of thing. So this term enthalpy is going to take into account this heat. Um, and then the entropy is going to take into account like how many different ways you can randomly be. Um, so you can think of it as kind of like the number of states you can occupy. So can you be like this? 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 Um, and so it seems random because if you were to look at like a population of molecules, they could all be in kind of different positions or they could be located in different places. And so this entropy is going to be um, this S term and um, entropy, good. Um, and so in terms of like free energy and that sort of thing. Um, and so by free energy, um, this is going to tell you about whether or not a reaction is spontaneous. Um, this doesn't mean that it's likely to happen because you also have to consider the activation energy. So the energy that's required to even get things going, like to get you off of that couch, there can be a high activation barrier. Um, and in biochemistry, often this is overcome with some sort of biological catalyst, AKA, an enzyme, um, which is a often a protein that's going to help like hold things in place, get things going, various things like that. If you're working in like a chemistry lab, maybe you have some sort of metal catalyst or something like that, something to actually um, lower that activation barrier. But um, regardless of that, whether or not the react the just gives free energy is going to take into account the free energy of the products and the free energy of the reactants. If the Gibbs free energy is negative, that means that the reaction is spontaneous. Um, and if it's not, it's non-spontaneous, but you can still get it to go with um, different things. But anyway, so we need to take into account whether this reaction like is going to occur spontaneously in that pack. So we already talked about how the change in enthalpy was going to be positive because we're taking in more heat than we're giving off. So this delta H, so the delta means like change in. So this delta H is going to be positive in that reaction and it's going to be endothermic. So if something is endothermic, it has a positive H and we said negative G was good. How are we going to get this negative? Well, the answer is we're going to get it negative by having a positive entropy because the entropy is going to get subtracted. And so if we have this, um, if we have this increase in entropy, then we can give um, this, we can get our negative, we can get a negative delta G. And this is going to, is what's going to happen in the case of our ice pack. We're going to be breaking up all these networks. Um, and so we're going to, um, the dissolved salt is now going to have more places that can, like it can be and rearrange itself in various ways and stuff like this. So in the case of this reaction, it's going to be endothermic and spontaneous.
It's also going to be, it also has a very low activation energy barrier. And this is why you have to keep this separated in the pouch inside of that bigger pouch. And it's why you need to like, once you break it open, it gets cold really quickly because it's um, very favorable. Okay, but not every salt that you dissolve is going to get cold. Um, so it's not going to be endothermic. So remember endothermic means it's taking heat from the inner or from the environment. Um, and so it feels cold. Some salts, when they dissolve and then you feel it, it'll feel hot. So this post was kind of uh, in part because I was making some solutions the other day and it felt really cold. And it was like, oh, this reaction is endothermic. I can stick it on a heat plate um, and that will get it to help dissolve. Um, because if you are adding heat, remember this needs heat to happen. So if you add heat, then you're gonna be able to help the reaction happen. But for some of them, I felt it and I was like, oh, this is getting warm. This reaction is exothermic. Now adding heat to that is not gonna help um, because the, that's like going to inhibit the, um, the stuff because he's kind of like a product there instead of a reactant. But anyway, what's the difference? So this has to do with whether the lattice energy, so whether the energy that's required to break up that ionic network, so this positive parts and the negative parts of the salt, um, whether breaking them apart is going to take more energy, um, and whether breaking apart the solvents is going to take more energy, whether the combined combination of that is going to be greater than the energy that you get when you make those new um, interactions. So remember, when you make those new interactions, you're going to um, get um, you're going to give off heat, so that part's going to be exothermic. But then the part that you're actually breaking stuff, that part's going to be endothermic. And so it's it's the balance of the two that's going to determine whether overall the reaction is going to be exo or endothermic. So if your lattice energy is greater than the solvation energy, um, so if it takes more to break it up apart than it does to... Um, to like, then you get back, then it's going to be endothermic. And this was the case we saw with our instant cold pack. Um, so our instant cold pack, this is going to be like our reaction. Um, and so we have our ammonium nitrate, um, there are other salts as well. Um, then you have your water and you have heat. So you have heat here as your reactant. And so you're, then you have here, when you see this AQ, this is going to be mean aqueous or dissolved in water. Um, so you have these ions apart. This is where we got that increase in entropy. These products have more freedom than the reactants. And we have heat um, in our reactants. So this means it's going to take in heat and this is where the, where the positive H came from. So other examples of um, things that you might find in an instant cold back, things that have this endothermic property can be like calcium ammonium nitrate, ammonium chloride, and magnesium sulfate. But what about those instant hot packs? Now here you want the opposite thing. So here you're gonna have heat as one of your like products. And so here's, that's why I was saying like, you don't want to heat this up because of that whole like the Chatelier's principle, basically things are gonna go, if you add things from one side, it goes kind of like a seesaw thing. If you add a reactant, it's gonna make it go to product. If it's gonna, if you add a product, it's gonna make it go to reactant more. Um, when you have like, things can go either way. So basically you don't wanna add the product because you're gonna inhibit the reaction but you want to add the reaction, the reagent so that you can get the reaction going. Um, so for this case, you wouldn't want to add heat, but you're gonna get some heat given off um, by the solution. Um, and this heat that's given off is going to be because it's going to take less energy to break it apart than you get from um, than you get from all those new interactions that you're going to form. So some examples of these um, you might find in instant hot packs are like magnesium sulfate and calcium chloride. So it really depends on the different, um, the different salt that you're dissolving. Um, and so, yeah, so that was the basics of how these instant cold packs and I guess instant hot packs do work. Um, and yeah, so now I can hopefully um, use these when it gets hot later.